Thank you, Monica. I'm very, very um, appreciative to be here at UCA and particularly to, to Monica for this gracious invitation to address you. I, I hope that my words will stimulate greater thought about how we make sense of social justice and questions of leadership and cultural democracy, which have been areas that I have been struggling for the last you know, almost 40 years, looking at the same issues, the same questions, as many of you sitting in this room. I want to begin with a quote that accentuates the underlying spirit of my remarks today. Paulo Freire wrote, the more radical the person is, the more fully he or she enters into reality, so that knowing it better, he or she can transform it. This individual is not afraid to, com to confront, to listen, to see the world unveiled. This person is not afraid to meet the people or to enter into dialogue with them. This person does not consider himself or herself the proprietor of history or of all people or the liberator of the oppressed. But he or she does commit himself or herself within history to fight at their side. That said, it is impossible for me to speak about university leadership for social justice within transnational and transcultural spaces today without unveiling the manner in which neoliberalism has eroded emancipatory efforts within the U.S. Academy. Despite the look of more people of color in the Academy, despite a kind of surface aspect what we're seeing is the erosion, the continued erosion of democratic values. Institutional bypassing of complex questions tied to diversity and emancipatory struggles for social justice have resulted in economic policies and practices that wittingly or unwittingly reproduce oppressive structures and relationships despite rhetorical claims to the contrary. This constitutes for me that little dirty little secret behind power and privilege that we often leave just, you know, underneath. In today's corporatized universities, students have become consumers of educational services rather than cultural citizens who grapple to understand themselves and their world. Knowledge has become a commodity for profit. Teaching a market transaction driven by standardized instructional models and banking pedagogy obsessed with the use of educational technology, punitive forms of assessment, data collection, and accountability regimes, as well as curriculum that for the most part has become narrowly instrumentalized. In this context, the troubled conditions of our world are easily obscured despite growing repression of democratic rights, increasing poverty in the midst of obscene wealth accumulation, a state of perpetual war, the proliferation of police shootings of innocent civilians, particularly in communities of color, the unprecedented incarceration of people of color, and state-sanctioned attacks against public education by unaccountable billionaires, corporate foundations, and the media. With few instances of courageous university leadership in opposition to corporatization, often the only form of peaceful dissent left in public is public resistance or mass protests, as we've witnessed recently at the University of Missouri, for example. Yet even the resignation of the president, Tim Wolf, according to The Atlantic, was an economic decision rather than a moral or an ethical decision. For had Wolf stayed and the football players continued to strike, the university would have lost millions of dollars. There's no question then that higher education today is deeply mired in a culture of economic rule often shrouded by conservative rhetoric that seeks to delimit genuine struggles for social justice in academia and the larger society. Glimpses of the rhetoric are apparent in conservative responses to university protests across the country. Harvard president, professor of law, pardon me, Alan Dershowitz, in a recent interview, sternly asserted, I quote, 
the last thing these students want is diversity. They want superficial diversity of gender, superficial diversity of color, but the last thing they want is diversity of ideas. We're seeing a curtain of McCarthyism descend over many college campuses. He further went on to compare the tyrannical students involved in campus protests to Nazi book burners of the 1930s. However, it is precisely this rhetorical call for the diversity of ideas, and I'll use my little rabbit, <laughs> you know, that has been ad nauseum, used ad nauseum in diversity debates to uh, subterfuge pressing concerns about social and material inequalities and institutional responsibilities, concerns that time and again have been overridden by an unrelenting culture of racism, of rampant greed, of wholesale surveillance, and the social containment of subaltern populations. With this in mind, Wendy Brown asserts that the American nightmare today constitutes an indefensible alliance of neoliberalism, conservatism, and the undoing of democratic life. She rightly argues that neoliberalism and neoconservatism are two distinct and contradictory political rationalities that converge in their devaluation of political liberty, equality, substantive citizenship, and the rule of law in favor of market-driven governance, institutional policies on one hand, and valorization of the state power for moralistic ends on the other. This convergence results in undemocratic institutional forms that despite social justice or diversity claims are indifferent to veracity and accountability and to political freedom and equality define even the liberal ideals of the US Academy. So much so that Braun warns neoliberal, neoliberal reason is converting the distinctly political character, meaning, and operation of democracy's constituent elements into economic ones. Liberal democratic institutions, practices, and habits may not survive this conversion. Radical democratic dreams may not either. As such, Transformative notions of multiculturalism and diversity within the university anchored upon community concerns have been derailed by an economic ethos that renders our difference a whore for the utilitarian pursuit of the affluent. Accordingly, scholarship, leadership, and activism for structural change, political inclusion, economic access, and human rights has given way to multicultural market niches the management of an international workforce, a colonizing paradigm of international education, and the portrayal of happy colored faces on public relations pamphlets and websites. Yet, in this in this efficient and very cost-effective neoliberal world where difference is celebrated, because everyone talks about celebrating diversity, which they, these those that are considered to be deficient and unable to march to a homogenizing bootstrap refrain are too often pushed to the margins of society, left abandoned, divested, impoverished, criminalized, and put behind bars with little concern for their numbers or their well-being. Blatant disregard of these of those unable to keep in step with the dehumanizing accountability culture that neoliberalism promotes is sadly as much at work today within the culture of our universities as within the corporate world. Accordingly, universities have become overwhelmingly driven as by an economic rationalism where the financial bottom line con capsizes any full-fledged notions of social justice, democratic participation, or community life. In his writings on the university, Henry Giroux terms, uses the term of, to, to speak of this phenomenon as economic Darwinism, drawn from the notion of social Darwinism, to illustrate the manner in which neoliberal policies within higher education have functioned overtly and covertly to support the survival of the fittest. Most specifically, he points to the policies of deregulation, of privatization, and the lack of concern for the public good, rendering both democratic education and the social welfare of our nation endangered species. 
He further implicates the values of unchecked competition, unbridled individualism, and a demoralizing notion of individual responsibility as major culprits in the, in the legitimation crisis and ethical impoverishment of neoliberal academic leaders who ascribe to a profit logic that undermines culturally democratic life. This disabling logic entrenched across the university is most evident within graduate school education where future academics and developing public intellectuals are initiated into a careerist social capital orientation that thwarts the necessary critical engagement for the construction of democratic knowledge. Knowledge with the potential to challenge advancing inequalities orchestrated by the wealthy and the powerful. Hence, from the moment that graduate students and young professors are installed as tenuous agents of the neoliberal academy, they are inducted into a contradictory culture of anti-democratic values that shape expectations of their teaching, research, and tenure process as it erodes their intellectual freedom. Similarly, an infantilizing leadership culture of institutional surveillance carried out by complicit gatekeepers is commonplace at every level of the enterprise. Structures of accountability have become more intense in the last decade as college and universities have instituted expectations that professors from all disciplines become effective grant writers and fundraisers in their quest for the security of tenured employment. Hence, a great deal of the energies of graduate students and young professors in major public research universities today are directed away from emancipatory efforts and community commitments and instead toward becoming published within refereed journals, getting publicly noticed as rising stars on the conference circuit, and developing effective grant writing skills while competitively shaping their research agendas to garner both private and public funds. Although none of this is entirely new to academe, the disappearance of tenure track positions and the increase in adjunct and part-time employment in the last decade along with brutal competition among new doctoral graduates for tenure track employment, has proven especially treacherous for those graduates saddled with huge debts. Moreover, with an exaggerated emphasis on STEM, this has made graduates in the humanities and the social sciences particularly vulnerable to current neoliberal priorities within higher education. However, it's worth noting here that STEM tenured faculty positions are not easily attained either, and, over, and more than 50% of all the jobs in the STEM field don't even require a bachelor's degree. I hope you get what I'm saying. I mean, I'm gonna be saying this over and over again, but part of what we have to struggle with is a kind of political ruse, a kind of ideological ruse that tries to convince us and create commonsensical notions about what is really needed in relationship to the universities and what is happening out in the societies. In concert with dwindling academic posts, young graduate students hoping to become tenured faculty or university administrators are counseled to abandon their idealistic intentions and to position themselves competitively for a job in ways that will, on one hand, gain them recognition as innovative thinkers, while on the other, make them good institutional fit. This generally points to possessing academic pedigree and entrepreneurial dis predisposition, core values of individualism and competition, a naive centrist or conservative political orientation, <clears throat> a subdued social justice outlook, and, a con and conduciveness to hierarchical leadership. Unfortunately, good institutional fit is too often linked to the subtle or not so subtle manner in which classism, racism, patriarchy, disabledism, homophobia, and religious chauvinism coalesce to preserve institutional conditions of privilege. <clears throat> Drawing on Peggy McIntosh's work 
on white privilege, we can point to university conditions of privilege reflected in the daily exercise of unequal power in higher education, conditions of privilege that betray promises of diversity that were made at another time. <clears throat> In the midst of the anti-war movement and civil rights struggles of the 1960s and the 1970s, the American university was challenged to break with its lily white male and class privilege tradition. The seeds of the current neoliberal assault on the academic borderlands, as Giroux suggests in the university in chains, can be found in the long-term authoritarian strategies put in place by conservatives who sought to win an ideological war against liberal intellectuals who argued for holding government and corporate power accountable as a precondition for extending and expanding the promise of an inclusive democracy. Excuse me. <coughs> you know, I, I, I tried to read this stuff. <laughs> Uh, I always tried to read this stuff with a certain amount of temperedness. I, I, temperedness was a word that, that Monica, but you know that insight is always a, a rage inside of me, a frustration about this stuff. <laughs> Those working uh, to democratize the, univer the university call for inclusion of more students and faculty of color, alongside the call for inclusive admissions and hiring practices, pressure was placed upon college and universities to transform the curriculum in ways that would not only be culturally relevant or responsive, but would also address the long-standing historical inequalities and oppression that persisted. <clears throat> Multicultural gains made within the large society and the university at the time were made, were very consistent with the liberal Keynesian inspired economics, which recognized the importance of using syst systematic government intervention to alleviate the downside of corporate capital investments. However, conservative laissez-faire views of classical microeconomics, which began to gain currency with the deregulatory policies of Reaganomics, became the powerful precursor to what we now call the new economy and its consequences of callous inequality. More to the point, a national report issued by Ronald Reagan's National Commission on Excellence in Education in 1983 was an aggressive move by neoliberal conservatives to de redefine the purpose of public education. A nation at risk stressed that the most effective recovery for both the doom and gloom of public education and our diminishing global superiority was for the American education system to function as an economic engine. The sprouting neoliberal educational vision of the ruling elite who manned the Reagan Commission and also began to forcefully tuck at diversity debates underway that, that were happening within higher education. As a greater number of intellectuals from the cultural, economic, gendered, and sexual margins began to enter graduate education, the presence of their politically distinct voices and transgressive views began to rouse backlash in the academy. It's not surprising then that by the early 1990s, the, po the politics of difference had become mired in the hyperbolic of the hyperbole of political correctness as mean-spirited attacks began to gnaw away at multicultural visions of equality and inclusion within the university, visions inspired by the struggles for self-determination. Conservative backlash within the university also extended beyond ethnic studies faculty, targeting women and gender studies, sexuality studies, Marxist, post-structural um, scholars who, according to Roger Kimball in Tenured Radicals, How Politics Has Corrupted Our Higher Education, had, be <laughs> had become the new establishment. Similar public assaults on higher education were in the works of Alan Bloom's Closing of the American Mind and Dinesh D'Souza's Illiberal Education, the Politics of Race and Sex on Campus, which alleged liberal bias at the university and pointed to the destructive impact of multiculturalism to the integrity of the Western canon and to American society. 
In place of more culturally democratic values, the proponents of economic Darwinism proposed a focus on entre entrepreneurship, derailing attention from social and material inequalities. As Brown has noted, and I quote, class and other impediments to servicing the entrepreneurial South are radically depoliticized, what the neoliberals call the equality to inequality is newly legitimated, thereby tabling democracy's formal commitment to egalitarianism. A permanent underclass and even a permanent criminal class, along with a class of non-citizens, are produced and accepted as an inevitable cost of such a society. Moreover, this right to inequality has resulted in a political culture that brazenly normalizes the immoral concentration of global power and wealth among a tiny elite. It is precisely this political culture of greed that has given toothless neoliberal multiculturalism, has created this, this notion of a kind of neoliberal multiculturalism, a conservative ideology of difference that deploys meritocratic justification to explain and legitimate inequalities. Adheren the adherents of this ideology enact a structure of public recognition, acknowledgments, and acceptance of multicultural subjects based on an ethos of self-reliance, individualism, and competition while simultaneously and conveniently rendering subject suspect or irrelevant social justice discourses and practices aimed at the redistribution of power and the redistribution of wealth. Accordingly, in a culture where a victim blaming and stigmatizing ideology drives the institutional solution of leaders, culturally democratic efforts to contend with the complexities inherent in an environment of racialized differences are often judged as disruptive, derisive, or offensive. This is so even today when academics such as Stephen Salaita, <laughs> who was considered too closely aligned with anti-imperialist struggles, are, is, you know, was chastised uh, while repressive conditions within the university remain intact. That particular case is an absolute important case for us to think about, it, particularly with respect to the question of how social media suddenly becomes implicated, where your private lives, we have no private lives. I mean, it's essentially our private lives have been removed from us, and there is no public space where you can communicate anymore without some kind of surveillance. I mean, these are issues that we need to take very, very seriously. Consequently, more progressive thinkers and leaders who entered the academy, or I'm going, I'm going to go back to this, this era of, of diversity, they find themselves today, many of us, more, you know, often more marginalized at the very moment when our scholarship and our political maturity might serve to more effectively challenge current inequalities as well as to forge a more promising democratic vision. And I say our because I'm part of that community. And just because I may be in a university where I may have a, a, a better condition, I can tell you that for all of me, there is at least a hundred of my colleagues who are my age, who are in their 60s, who find themselves being treated as if they're just simply irrelevant in respect to scholarly conversations. This may also be associated with an appetite for so-called originality and innovativeness of scholarship, a neoliberal academic expectation that inadvertently stifles the evolution of substantive diversity critiques within the university and the larger society. What's, you know, we use these terms of innovation, we, you know, we want, but we don't think about what that means. If you're always in the newness, who does the deep work? Who does the work over time? the depth work, the depth analysis around these issues, if we're, if we're constantly dealing with innovation. Not surprisingly, the educational advances of the diversity era proved to be short -lived, a short-lived moment in the history of American education for as 
more subaltern students and faculty began to find their ways into the university classroom, faculty meetings and government tables, the more aggressive both conservatives and neoliberal forces became in efforts to swing the pendulum back to a more homogeneous cultural moment where an economically driven meaning of freedom and justice prevailed and the marketplace harrowed as the true purveyor of equality. It should not be surprising then to learn that incessant neoliberal drive to quantify worth, value, or fit by perceived capital return did not prove friendly to university di diversity or the academic borderlands, a term that draws on Gloria Anzaldúa's concept of borderlands to refer to an intellectual terrain of struggle where the mixing of cultures, philosophies, theories, spiritualities, and everyday practices of life defy the transcendent character of the traditional canon because its exclusion, notably of men and, um, and women of color, is marked as a product of the white male imagination. And it continues to be. We think, we think that just because there's folks of color sitting in the room, that the issue of patriarchy has somehow been done, or that the issue of racism has somehow been ameliorated. That's, that's Significant features of the academic borderlands included the increasing number then of women and students of color entering the colleges and universities, the vast flourishing of non-traditional scholarship, and the overwhelming presence of dissonant voices calling for cultural, political, and economic change while pushing forcefully against centuries of racializing and heteronormative patriarchal values. As border intellectuals were transgressing the traditional boundaries of a variety of disciplines, rising neoliberal imperatives were making their way into the university just in time to conveniently push back fiercely against critical interventions precisely designed to challenge the structures of inequality and reinvigorate the democratic potential of higher education. In many colleges and universities, administrators strategically worked to diffuse what they so-called, co you know, the cultural wars. Some, of, some folks here must remember that when the, the whole term around the cultural wars. By imposing cries of fiscal ex exigencies to cut programs, institute hiring freezes, harass non-compliant faculty, reject tenure cases, and even move to merge or eliminate entire departments. As the liberal ideals of higher education became more and more clouded, universities across the university became more aligned with the narrow rationality of neoliberal objectives. Border intellectuals were pushed farther into marginal spaces that served to limit their participation in the life of departments and the governance of the university. High-level administrators, now functioning like corporate CEOs, were less and less concerned with past promises of diversity as they spent more time hobnobbing with corporate executives, foundation officials, and other big business advocates who could potentially help them recover the losses from public monies. In the process, the values, priorities, and private interests of those who held the reins to research dollars tightly redefined the purpose of higher education, heavily tilting the enterprise with incentives to support economic self-sufficiency, unfettered deregulation, unrelenting privatization, marketplace competition, accountability schemes, technological supremacy, and maximizing economic profit. I'll give you a, a, one of the examples of how research monies have been affected in this so-called moment of STEM. At most of the universities, when you look at where the money has been going in the last five years, you will find this incredible inequality with respect to technology. So there's this great sum of money going towards technology, which of course, technology is like this beast that you have to feed, you know, keep feeding and feeding and feeding because they keep coming up with newer and newer and newer stuff. Meanwhile, money and money, 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 and money is going out, money that could have gone for different projects, for projects that could have been much more involved with respect to the humanizing of life on the, on, the, on the campus, but also humanizing relationships of the campus with the communities that surround them. Despite protests against priorities that equated profit 
progress and prestige with policies of deregulation and privatization and free market competition and bootstrap economics, university administrators have been too easily herded into the fold with promises of dollars to build new buildings, expand our dependency on technology, support conservative curricula, and hire faculty ready to carry out the political agendas of public and private funders. Hence, through both covert and overt means, the political values and financial priorities of corporate rule have sought greater control of student intellectual formation, the labor of academics, and the research agenda, and the research agendas in order to legitimate transnational enterprises. With a keen eye on profit, control over resources, and the use of working class communities for warfare, the neoliberal rhetoric of difference has fractured strategically, pardon me, has functioned strategically to increase production, maximize commerce, and support the growing needs of U.S. militarization and the economic impact of global violence. In fact, a recent report entitled The Most Militarized Universities in America noted that 17 powerhouse research universities traditionally supporting the military-industrial complex rank at the top 100, including John Hopkins, Penn State, Georgia Tech, Harvard, Stanford, MIT, and USC. The federal government awarded $3 billion last year to these schools alone. And rather than study traditional weapon systems, as some might think if you hear of the militarization of the university, these universities primarily carry out classified research on intelligence technologies, cybersecurity, and big data analytics. Also related to this phenomenon is the fact that the most common academic concentrations for military workers are actually in the STEM field. In fund, this, as funding then has become more scarce for faculty positions and research that could serve as a countervailing force, fewer resources are available for examining critically social issues tied to material inequalities. A larger consequence here is that the university now fully in bed with corporate interests has systematically eroded the university's potential to cultivate the next generation of critical scholars and leaders who can offer a counter narrative to the national security state that we are living in. Hence, scholars and leaders in the borderland today are expected to align ourselves more narrowly within particular disciplines of study, whether history, anthropology, sociology, or economics, in contrast to transdisciplinary approaches that have been most at the heart of teaching and research for social change. I mean, one of the reasons why I stayed within education, why I did a degree in education, was because it was one of the places that allowed me to do transdisciplinary work. Because what is really clear to me is that we cannot possibly forge any kind of a substantive critique about what is happening in our society and around the world unless we look at it from multiple lenses. It's absolutely important that we engage culture, that we engage politics, that we engage the economy, that we engage ideology, that we engage these questions of power. In the world of economic Darwinism, traditional disciplinary approaches provide these neat and tidy intellectual alliances than does counter-hegemonic scholarship produced by scholars in ethnic, uh, feminist, post-colonial, and queer studies. This tyranny of strict disciplinary boundaries worked well to police and monitor the scholarship of, of black, Latino, indigenous, and other border intellectuals, as well as discipline current efforts of graduate students and young faculty from subaltern communities. Similarly, faculty and university leaders of color who persist in their advocacy for community-based research and participatory approaches in the interests of oppressed communities are often marginalized, derisively dubbed as activists, and their scholarly work and emancipatory efforts challenge as mere opinion at times, or they are asked for excessive requests for proof, despite historical evidence and bountiful research to substantiate their conclusions. Unfortunately, at the moment when they are most needed, 
critical scholars and leaders for social justice are often exiled from meaningful participation by an anti-democratic conservative way that banishes formidable findings tied to social justice, human rights, and economic democracy to the wasteland of irrelevancy. In a climate where the international control of knowledge and the maximizing of profit is the greatest concern, university administrators have often served wittingly or unwittingly as gatekeepers through a banking form of leadership that thwarts the critical praxis needed for social change. The dehumanizing impact <clears throat> of social and material inequalities perpetrated by hierarchical and undemocratic forms of university leadership impel us to unveil the hidden curriculum and its anti-dialogical values and practices in an effort to move towards a decolonizing vision of leadership. By doing so, our task is to counter traditional social arrangements of accountability and institutional priorities that thwart social justice aims as we work to create a critical praxis of leadership to support self-determination and culturally democratic life. This begins with a willingness to disrupt epistemologies that exclusively privilege Western assumptions, assumptions attached to class, racialized, patriarchal, and heterosexist codes of conduct that result in what Boaventura de, San, de Sousa Santos calls an abyssal divide, where the other is rendered irrelevant or non-existent. This constitutes one of the most difficult challenges that critical leaders for social justice face when trying to establish alliances across dominant subordinate cultural divides. I just want to stop for a moment. What, what he means by this abyssal divide is that, that the philosophical assumptions of Western culture are such that this divide exists that anything that cannot be identified with and that exists outside of it is considered to not exist or not be relevant and have no place with respect to policy or practices. And often this epistemological chauvinism, if you will, is so problematic in that it comes out when people are trying to speak across their communities, across cultural conditions that are different. And so the struggle for us is how do we come to a place where a true diversity is possible, which means that epistemologically, we have to have different opportunities to construct knowledge in ways that are inherent to our own communities and to our own histories. <clears throat> Yet what is clear for those of us who have remained in this retracted emancipatory struggle is this. If there is to be genuine emancipatory approaches to university educational leadership, it demands this colonizing approach that supports both individual and community empowerment. This signals an emancipatory vision also that embraces the indigenous call of idle no more and extends beyond the academy where the insights and participation of administrators, faculty, students, and community members from historically oppressed communities are central to the leadership for social justice in education. Inherent to such an emancipatory vision is a set of principles and ethical commitments that must inform the foundation for educational leadership. Briefly, these include the following. The first is that critical leadership must be seen as pedagogical. The notion moves us away, this notion moves us away from the hierarchical, hierarchical and individualistic banking model of leadership to one that embraces leadership as a social phenomena that must exist communally and evolves pedagogically through open structures of participation. The vision here is to learn together, that we learn together, that we lead together as a way of life in which we transform the world as community through a humanizing praxis of inquiry and decision making where the common good stretches across all our differences. The second piece is critical leadership as moral commitment. In Pedagogy of Freedom, Freire asserted that human existence is in fact a radical and profound tension between good and evil, between dignity and indignity, between decency and indecency, between beauty and the ugliness of the world. 
yet it is it has been this unwillingness to contend with institutional tensions and difficult moral questions within educational institutions and the larger society that has resulted in oppressive bureaucracies of universities and a paradigm of leadership ruled by absolute top-down and expedient policies that ignore conditions of human suffering and material oppression. Inherent to a critical theory of leadership for social justice is understanding that if education is political, then critical leadership too is a political act. As As such, it is informed by a question-posing approach to leadership, which recognizes that culture and power are inextricably linked to any system of organization. That said, there must be consistent and humanizing protocols for examining in an ongoing and organic manner the consequences of decisions that are made and their impact upon the most disenfranchised. Through such a process, a critical leadership for social justice must create the conditions where people are free to question why. A critical leadership for social justice is never a neutral affair. As such, the vision of leadership exposes illusions of neutrality in the face of oppressive policies and practices. In its place, a dialogical process of leadership opens a way for honest questioning, open expressions of voice, multiple forms of participation, and genuine structures of democratic decision-making guided by a moral imperative inextricably tied to the consequences of policy decisions and practices, particularly upon the most vulnerable populations. Thus, the purpose of a critical leadership, first and foremost, encompasses an, un an uncompromising commitment to the empowerment of self-determination of the most disenfranchised, the transformation of relationships, institutional structures, and material conditions that perpetuate domination and reproduce all forms of inequality and social exclusions, and an ethos of educational practice that nurtures and cultivates democratic life for all people. Critical leadership, then, must be seen as a dialectical process. This reminds us that there's always a dialectical tension between the needs of individuals and the needs of communities. It is this tension that permits for individuals to participate in the evolution of a collective process of self-determination without degenerating into moral relativism and instead being informed by a humanizing moral compass guided by love for self, for others, and the world. It is this dialectical tension that can also help thwart forms of injustice driven by apolitical and ahistorical readings of the world that only serve the few. In this vision of leadership, critical dialogue is the political means for empowerment and establishing participatory community. This entails purposeful communication that leads to self-determination and political action, a collective process of conscientization, communal labor that supports the development of solidarity, and an open and humanizing process of inquiry. As would be expected, the Freudian concept of conscientization or conscientisation defines the ongoing aim and practice of critical leadership for social justice. This requires us to remain ever vigilant in our continuing evolution as cultural workers and leaders as we seek to practice and develop together a greater sense of critical social consciousness. This points to personal consciousness of one's individual conditions and social location, social consciousness of, so, of the structures that, that are involved in these institutions in which we work, understanding how these two intersect, awareness of power relations that inform cultural, political, social, and economic conditions. And I'm talking about power relationships both on the formal level and power relationships on the informal level. Acceptance, and you all know what I mean by that, I'm sure. Acceptance of our individual and social responsibility as cultural citizens, and most importantly, as subjects of history. 
However, none of this, none of this is possible without an ongoing process of cultural democratic negotiation, where the dialectical tension between authority and freedom are engaged organically within the actual context in which they, these tensions arise. The dialectical tension between authority and freedom is simply a part of the human condition. About this, Freddy insists, it is not possible to have authority without freedom or vice versa. Hence, we must be willing to practice a critical form of leadership that demands our full presence beyond vulgar competition and fantasizing micromanagement or egotistical ambitions and careerist pursuits of institutional recognition. Such a leadership for social justice calls for a personal vigilance and political groundedness within the context of organizational life. These critical qualities assist us to read the world more accurately, particularly with respect to the ideological intersections at work in all organizational structures. We can think of this theoretically as an axis relationship where there is an intersection between the continuum of tyranny and powerlessness on one hand and the continuum of absolute authority and absolute freedom on the other. This is important to the struggle for social justice because people in any organization will exhibit different response patterns across these continuums depending on their political coherence, their grounded experience, their cultural worldview, and the depth of their personal and communal commitment to social justice. In concert with Freire's philosophy, engaging cultural context is essential. We cannot do our work without engaging the different cultural contexts. And this means moving beyond recipes of what social justice looks like. How, just, how social justice looks in each of our universities has to be linked to what is happening in those universities. How power relationships are, are held how practices are carried out. It's not a recipe, it's a matter of engagement that is requiring us to be vigilant and diligent in our practice. Often the, 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 the hegemony of the dominant worldview functions systematically to margin, marginalize other ways of being, as I've mentioned before. This phenomenon is what prompted Freire to argue, one cannot expect positive results from an educational or political action program which fails to respect the particular view of the world held by the people. Such a program constitutes cultural invasion, good intentions notwithstanding. One of the most important quotes that Freire put out is this understanding that cultural invasion takes place not only as a material reality, but as a social and psychological reality. What often the CRT people call microaggressions. What I want to talk about are microaggressions, but I want to talk about the macroaggressions. Because that's without engaging both and understanding their relationship, it is impossible for us to transform the inequalities that persist. Another significant dimension of a critical theory of leadership is a commitment to relationships of solidarity that, nurture, that are nurtured through the integration of our human faculties, the evolution of our political grace. Political grace for me is a collective force generated by those who committed together to struggle for democratic life, seek to connect through communal relationships of struggle. They understand that life requires struggle, it requires labor, that we are here to work. We, if we're going to, to transform the world, it's not just gonna happen by, you know, by wishing it. It's gonna happen through our committed labor. Moreover, given its emancipatory purpose, a critical praxis of leadership requires the ex exercise of an integral process, one in which our minds, our hearts, our bodies, and our spirits are welcomed in the active service of liberation. This integral dynamic generates the conditions for political grace to touch our communal exchanges. A critical theory of leadership must then encompass a pedagogical purpose that rebels against the fragmenting and fracturing of our humanity and instead aims to prepare and support us all to live with a greater sense of love as a political force that can connect us to the truth of our material conditions that surround us and moves us more openly towards relationships of solidarity and social justice. 
which can change the context in which we work, in which we live, in which we love, and in which we dream. For Freire, the question of ethics is at the forefront of, this, of his thinking. The point is made obvious in his book, Pedagogy of Freedom. Three particularly significant points, I believe four, I have four points in his argument with respect to leadership are these. One, the countering of determinism, not to believe that any relationship or any organization is determined. We as human beings create those, those institutions. We as human beings can change them. The need to assume responsibility for our lives and for our communities. Three, the practice carried out only, that, that our practice can only be carried out through the fellowship and solidarity that we build together. And four, understanding of our unfinishedness. Freire wrote, if the world were created finished, it would no longer be susceptible to transformation. At the heart of his idea of unfinishedness is also this recognition that oppression is never a permanent condition. I mean, this is, this is what keeps me going. What has kept me going for 40 years is that I truly believe this to the absolute core of my being. This does not have to be this way. Racism does not have to exist. Inequalities are not necessary for human beings to live together. There's no question that a critical leadership for social justice then requires a fundamental shift in how we define our labor. This demands we shed our internalized oppression, eject colonizing ideologies of domination, establish solidarity with one another, recognize ourselves as subjects of history, garner the courage to speak out when necessary, even if we're standing alone, and a cultivate a strong sense of our social agency in order that we can name, critique, decolonize, and reinvent our world anew in the interests of a just and democratic future. Drawing from Freire's notion of indispensable qualities of struggle, I want to quickly offer two overlapping sins of indispensable qualities of leadership for social justice. The first is tied to an ethics of political struggle, and the second to an ethics of personal struggle, because I believe we have to understand that they go together. Qualities I link to an ethics of political struggle include knowledge of the micro and macro systems and their relationship, knowledge of self-contradictions and our personal struggles, to recognize the link between culture and power, the ability to read power, both formal and informal, to be conscious of language use and relationship to power. It was funny, I was at a, at a, at a, a workshop, the, the wonderful workshop earlier, and a young woman used the term you know, that, that these kids were selling food in the black market. I mean, beautiful, she did a beautiful presentation. And, but, but what I wanted to say to her, and I didn't get a chance to speak to her, was let's not call it the black market. Let's call it an underground economy that kids create for themselves. It's a very different way of, of thinking. I mean, just understanding that we have to shift the way we speak, the terms that we use. Emphasis on voice, democratic participation, and collaborative decision making, consistently moving towards dialogue, and acting critical authority in the interests of democratic life, politically to be politically strategic, to choose our battles wisely. We have to move beyond the ego. It's not about being right. It's about trying to do the right thing. What is the best thing in this situation? What that means is what can bring the best consequences, the best outcomes for the most people. Commitment to solidarity and community self-determination, political change understood as part of an ongoing process of life and embracing a historical or a long view of revolutionary struggle for social justice. This is nothing, this is not something that changes. We are part of a long trajectory of freedom fighters. We are part of a long trajectory of people who have been fighting for their humanity, for their freedom. The second set of indispensable qualities of critical leadership 
then is tied to some of the personal things we need to engage as well. The knowledge of our own personal struggles and our limitations. Self-vigilant in one's attitudes and behaviors towards self and others. Commitment to the common good. I always think about the, the young people in, in, um, in Arizona during that struggle, and they would say, tu eres mi otro yo. I mean, it's a beautiful, you are my other me. I mean, if we walk the world with that sense that you are my other me, that that kinship exists for us as a human family within our communities and beyond our communities, we would create a different world. Confidence and humility, comfortable with knowing and not knowing. Having the humility to, to, to know what we don't know and be okay with it. I mean, it, it, I, I, sometimes it's so frustrating. I mean, the hardest thing within the university is no one wants to come off like they don't know. So instead, <laughs> And the other side of that is everybody wants to believe they're the smartest person in the damn room. I mean, and you know what? You can't get into the university unless you're pretty smart. I mean, and, and, when, when, and what smart means is, man, that somehow you figured out how to maneuver yourself, you know, through the stuff. Come on, let's be real. Or you had people who, who bolstered you in. We need to have faith and respect for others. We need to present and engage a style of, com of communication and participation, a, a present, to be present with one another. We need to be courageous and thoughtful when challenging others. We need to exercise collective sensibility in decision-making with others. It's not just about what I want or what you want. It's about what we want and what we do together. We need to be what Paolo called impatiently patient. <laughs> <laughs> so that we can respect the process, but we still push. <laughs> Commitment to living and working and loving with integrity, to focus on nurturing relationships rather than on being right, to be grounded in revolutionary love, a love anchored in justice and humanity, to have that thirst for justice be part of our everyday life. Forgiveness for one's own and others' limitations and practices. We all struggle. We all mess up. We all, you know, and if I were in another place, I'd say something else, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> that we must have <laughs> We must have compassion for struggles faced in our efforts to become fully conscious. We must have respect for the, the preciousness of all life. And we must embrace humor, joy, and the sensual dimensions of our humanity as we go out and we do this work. We are sentient beings. We exist in a body. We cannot pretend like we're just, you know, like this head out here thinking. Let me kind of bring this thing to a close. Ya era tiempo, right? It's about time. <laughs> I am watching them, and I'm thinking, like, how do you guys do this? <laughs> Giroux has argued, at the very least, academics should be responsible to and for a politics that raises serious questions about how students and educators negotiate the institutional, pedagogical, and social relationships shaped by diverse ideologies and dynamics of power, especially as these relations mediate and inform competing visions regarding whose interests the university might serve, what role knowledge plays in furthering both excellence and equity, and how higher education defines and defends its own role in relation to its often stated, though hardly operationalized, allegiance to egalitarian and democratic impulses. For radical intellectuals, the university still represents an important terrain of struggle and key pedagogical space in the forging of democratic life. You know, part of what has happened is our public spaces have been eaten up. The, the, most of the public spaces now you have to go pay for, you know, that to, to be with people. Education is one of the places where we still have a public space in which we can engage issues. This is often directly tied to critical educational efforts then made by professors who seek to create political links between the classroom, college campus, the community, and the world in ways that foster and support a culturally democratic understanding of university life. Critical leadership approaches are effective in creating emancipatory conditions within university classrooms and the university 
in general, to support meaningful critical reflection and dialogue, the development of voice and collective participation, and the building of solidarity among university administrators, faculty, and students. In fact, if it were not for the work of scholars of color, many of us sitting in this room and then many of us here would not have found a place to flourish in the academy, despite legitimate critiques that have been launched, which I've launched earlier, and the need to continue pushing the boundaries of legitimacy toward a more humanizing university culture. A critical leadership for social justice that supports public democratic life and political dissent creates the conditions of the, uh, for universities administrators and faculty and students to grapple rigorously not only with theories and practices of democratic life as a cognitive phenomenon, but also ask them to tackle rigorously and in the flesh the meaning and consequences of material inequalities and ideologies of racism, orientalism, Islamophobia, sexism, homophobia, heterosexism, disabled. I mean, we just go on and on. These different ways in which people are excluded or in which people are boxed in. In the last three decades, we have seen neoliberalism steadily negate the hard-earned opportunities gained by earlier civil rights struggles. Yet what is made clear by this history is that democracy is never guaranteed, which is truer today than ever. And as such, we must always keep in mind that democracy is never a given, but rather entails an ongoing emancipatory struggle for political vision and participation within both the university and the society. As such, higher education exists as a contested terrain of struggle, given the potential of education to function as a democratizing force. However, we cannot overcome the perils and pitfalls of current conditions if our work is not firmly grounded in an imaginative and creative political vision that requires us to consistently reach beyond the comprehensibility of this unjust and racialized economic order. If we want to talk about a social justice for the future, we need to understand that sometimes when ideas come around social justice, they may seem incomprehensible because we have not been conditioned to understand them or to know them. As imaginative, fluid, and grounded political vision of struggle then is particularly necessary today in that our labor for social justice is indeed made more difficult in this historical moment when neoliberalism has made a farce of the democratic ideal of civic engagement, undermining the public good and the power of our differences. To counter this travesty, we must move in theory and practice beyond re reformism and embrace in our daily practice wider possibilities which might allow us in a Deleuzean sense to bring something incomprehensible into the world. For this is the true stuff whence genuine social and political transformation is born. This demands from us more profound sense of our human affiliation, the evolution of consciousness and a reinvestment in the collective power of social movement and political encounters across our differences. Towards this end, we can strive to become politically vigilant in our, in our responses to the world so that we do not fall prey to the common contradictions of either neoliberalism or academic elitism that easily betray our liberatory dreams. This requires that we understand that none of us, no one exists outside the system and that none of us is free of contradictions and as such a purity of politics or sectarianism is not what I'm talking about. I do not believe that that is the answer. This speaks to a political vision where uncertainty, ambiguity, discomfort, and incomprehensibility exist in dialectical alliance with their negation. Through the latitude that such political awareness affords us, we can more easily enter into critical engagement with the complexities and nuanced ways in which hegemony impacts our lives as educators and world citizens, as well as the many differences that exist among us as a consequence of our cultural histories and our material conditions of survival. At the heart of such awareness must also be the recognition that liberation, whether in the university, our communities, or the larger world, can only be enacted through a radical 
imaginative, hopeful, and loving political vision where neither diversity nor unity are sacrificed. And most importantly, to persist in this long historical struggle for justice requires that we as individuals and collective beings face daily our deeply condi conditioned fear of freedom and dare to be powerful together. So I want to end drawing on Audre Lorde's a beautiful, wonderful Audre Lorde, her words when I say, when we dare to be powerful, to use our strength in the service of our emancipatory vision, then it becomes less and less important whether we are afraid. With this in mind, let us echo the strength and commitment of the many freedom fighters across our histories and on our college campuses today and dare to be powerful together. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.